holding a mic, I'm singing, so this is going to be a little bit different for me. I know everybody's busy, and he's going to talk amongst himself, so I'll try and talk as loud and clearly as I can. Um, I had a big thing all written out, and I was going to read you guys this stuff, but I think I'm just going to try and skim over it, keep it really light and interesting, so don't bore you to death. <clears throat> um, I wanted to talk a little bit about the science of cannabis, a little bit about the history of cannabis, and try and figure out uh, why everybody is using it and why some people aren't. How many people here use cannabis? All right. How many people here use cannabis recreationally? How many people here use cannabis as a medicine? I'm happy you guys are correct and happy you are in denial. Because everyone uses cannabis as a medicine. In my opinion, uh, there's no such thing as recreational use of cannabis. <clears throat> Any plant that you use that improves your body function and your mind function, that does not cause you harm, in my opinion, is a medicine. And that includes food. You know, if you think about what food is and nutraceuticals, a lot of people eat health food and they're just gobbling it down. They're like, hey, I feel great. That's awesome. But they're not necessarily thinking, hey, I'm going to eat this orange because it has uh, vitamin C in it. The vitamin C is going to affect my immune system. And they just eat it because they like the way it tastes and it feels good. Same thing for cannabis. You know, we use cannabis because we like the way it feels and because it tastes good. <clears throat> but there's a lot more going on. And in order to really monopolize, or not I shouldn't say monopolize, in order to use something effectively, you first have to really understand what it's doing. So, how many people know that cannabis is good for cancer? How many people know that if your cancer is progesterone or estrogen positive and you take THC, your cancer tumors will grow bigger? One person. Yeah, a lot of people don't know that. There's a lot of really amazing things about cannabis that can help you. And a lot of things about cannabis that can actually harm you if you don't know what you're doing. So uh, if you have cancer and you think it's as easy as just going down to the dispensary and saying, hey, give me some oil and I'm going to fix my cancer. That is not the case. You really need to talk to someone who knows a little bit more about cannabinoids and how they affect your body and what they're doing for you. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, so, how many of us know that the American government has a patent on cannabinoids uh, for use against Parkinson's and Alzheimer's and cancer and all these other things, and yet, on the other hand, they have the DEA saying, uh, and Health Canada saying cannabis has no medicinal value. Uh, that will give you a pretty good idea of why Pfizer and Merrick and even Johnson and Johnson are quietly sitting behind the scenes trying to make damn sure that this doesn't happen. Because there's a lot of people walking around sick that are a virtual gold mine for them because they're going to give you stuff that just continues to keep you sick but treats your symptoms. There's cannabinoids that can actually treat your illness and stop all that BS. <clears throat> How many people know that cannabis works synergistically with opioids? There you go, there's a couple of people who know. If you take cannabis while you are on opioids, it's a reuptake inhibitor on the same receptor, and it will actually increase the life of your opioid in your body. So it'll last longer, and it takes less. This is a big reason why Big Pharma does not want people taking cannabis. You're going to have to use less opioids, and they're going to work better. So they sell less opioids. <clears throat> oh, and I wanted to give a shout out to BJ. He just did the talk on the bugs. He is looking like a ghost because he just had a baby girl, baby boy, last night. So give it up for BJ. I use his bugs religiously. I've been using them for four years. I pride myself on not spraying anything I haven't made myself on my plants and just using my little mercenaries to take care of business. So. You should definitely talk to BJ if you want to clean up your garden. Um, how many people think or have heard that cannabis can cause schizophrenia? Nobody. Oh yeah, there's a few. Uh, so that's a half truth. Um, cannabis cannot cause schizophrenia, but if you have a genetic predisposition for schizophrenia, like someone in your family has schizophrenia in your bloodline, um, there's a genetic marker you can actually get tested for that will tell you that if you have a predisposition to schizophrenia because if you take high doses of THC, just the same as estrogen and progesterone positive cancers, it can actually cause an onset of symptoms. And you can all of a sudden start to present with uh, schizophrenia. 
Let's see. Cannabis can make you stupid because it kills brain cells. That's an absolute myth. Cannabis does not kill brain cells. Smoke kills brain cells. Smoke causes oxygen deprivation, which kills brain cells. That's how they killed that monkey that they did their little study on, that, where they came up with the idea that cannabis kills brain cells. In all truth, cannabis actually, there's con certain cannabinoids, cannabigerol, will actually regenerate brain cells and cause brain cells to grow. <clears throat> What else we got here? Uh, cannabis can stimulate appetite. We all know that, we've heard of the munchies, but there's actually a cannabinoid called THCV, cannabivarin, that actually suppresses appetite. There's some pretty big money being invested in THCV as a uh, dieting drug right now. <laughs> so African land race strains um, are the ones that you usually find that have a lot of THCV in them. So if you can invest in some of those, that's going to be pretty big in the very, very near future. Uh, I personally have a strain that I bred myself that everyone else who has used it has dubbed Boner Weed. I didn't choose that name. I don't like that name much, but uh, it can, certain types of cannabis, certain terpenes can actually increase the blood flow to your favorite bits in your body. <clears throat> and this can actually help thwart erectile dysfunction and is kind of the magic ingredient that's happening to my friends over here that have their love sauce that they use. I can't remember what it's called. What is it called again? What's that? Lila. 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 I don't know. One of those. It's Lila or Lila. L-I-L-A. Um, and that's really common in, in uh, California. They have lots of people using this stuff. You rub it on your private favorite parts, and then you go to town, and it increases your your experience in all sorts of different ways. Works for both men and women. But uh, you can also eat it. You know, if you eat it, you can get the same effect. Lasts a lot longer. It's a little harder to control. You might end up going on a little ride if you're not careful. Uh, what else we got here? Ha! Ah, who knows what CBN is? CBN. Anybody? No? Um, CBN is created when THC degrades. So, I know my mom and, and a lot of their friends back in the day when they were doing the hippie thing, they used to take their buds and they'd dry them out and then wrap them in cellophane and then punch holes in them and then stick them in the attic where it was nice and warm and just leave them. And that would actually cause some of the THC to degrade into CBN, which helps you with sleep. It's amazing for sleep. It's the most sedative uh, cannabinoid that there is. And so when your pot turns a nice orange color, you know you got lots of CBN in there, take that, turn that into oil, you have yourself a really awesome sedative for dealing with stuff, <clears throat> excuse me, for dealing with uh, non-sleep issues. Uh, CBN also increases bone growth. If you've broken a bone, if you've hurt yourself, and you've fallen down and you can't get up, you just give yourself a little shot of CBN and over time and it'll help regrow your bone. Uh, who here has ever been way, way, way too fucked up when they ate some edibles? Like pretty much five out of seven times that I've eaten edibles, I've totally just been that guy on the couch and I slumped over like, I think I just died and I'm just leaving my body maybe. Uh, this is because when you eat cannabis, uh, it converts to a metabolite in your liver uh, that is called 11-hydroxy, 11 11 tetrahydrocannabinol, and it is five times more psychoactive than THC alone. Edibles account for more than 90% of all hospital visits for cannabis overdose. So if you want to avoid that, you can go sublingual. A lot of people mix up sublingual, which is putting drops under your tongue that goes directly into your blood via the mucosal tissue in your mouth with eating cookies or jellies or any of these things. If you eat it, it's going to be five times stronger. You eat something that's 400 milligrams of THC, you just consumed the equivalent of 2,000 milligrams of THC, and it will rock your world. Some people are more immune to it. I have a coworker who's completely immune to it. He's a beast. He can eat that stuff like it's going out of style. It just blows my mind. Um, <clears throat> now, the only other way that's really good other than sublingual, probably the best way is to do rectal suppositories. You can take cannabis oil and put it in your bum. Uh, a lot of people don't do that because it's very awkward and embarrassing to do if you're anywhere but your house. But it's by far the most effective way to get cannabinoids into your blood. And it is the most economical way because it's, it's the place where you can absorb the most, the fastest, over a long period of time. <clears throat> now if you're not into that, sublingual is, is the next best thing. 
put drops under your tongue. It's going to get into your bloodstream very, very fast. It's going to skip that first pass and not give you that 11 hydroxy metabolite that's going to rock your world. Maybe land you in the hospital. <clears throat> no one's ever died from cannabis overdose. It's impossible. It's actually designed not to be able to affect your uh, body functions <clears throat> that could actually kill you. Uh, so a lot of people are into smoking. Smoking is great, but it's definitely not the way that I would recommend that you use cannabis if you're using it to treat illness. Uh, vaporization is a lot better because you're able to control the temperature. You control the temperature, and that means that you're able to control the outcome, the medical outcome. So if you're looking to have lots of sleep, then you want everything completely decarboxylated. You want all of your raw cannabis to be heated and then turned into something that will actually get you high. Uh, if you're looking to treat stuff like cancer or Lyme disease, you want a 50-50 split of the acid form, which is the raw plant form, which does not get you high. You can walk outside, find somebody's big outdoor bud that is a friend of yours that you know that is giving you permission, and bite the top off of it, and it's not going to get you high. Uh, it's not going to do a tremendous amount for you either because it's not really bioavailable unless you mix it with an oil. <clears throat> but uh, once you decarboxylate it by heating it or leaving it in, out in UV light for too long or even exposed to air for too long, it will slowly decarboxylate your product. With a vaporizer, you can choose 195 degrees, doesn't kill your terpenes, still decarboxylates most of your medicine and leaves you some acid form in there as well. So that's by far the best way to use your cannabis as a medicine if you're looking to really treat something serious, especially something like lung cancer where it's localized, you can get your cannabinoids to, to soak in right at the source, right where you need them. You can do transdermal applications. Uh, you gotta mix your cannabis with soy lecithin, which has phosphatidylcholine in it, which will allow it to penetrate deeper into your tissue and stay there for seven days. It's amazing how long you can get the cannabis to actually stay in your tissue. So if you're treating something like skin cancer, you definitely want to have soy lecithin in there, mixed as well as you can, preferably with ultrasound, but most people don't have that. Um, and it will be far, 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 far more effective. Uh, we know what it does for seizures. There's cannabidiol. There's a lot of confusion over what's hemp, what's cannabis, what's marijuana, what's marijuana, thanks to Health Canada with their stupid H. Um, and uh, <clears throat> And it's all cannabis. It's all cannabis sativa. You look it up in the dictionary or in the encyclopedia, cannabis sativa at the top. Ruderalis is just a form of plant that, that uh, isn't bound by the light cycle to actually flower. It will flower automatically. It comes from places like up north where the days get super, super long, or it's like, oh my God, is it ever gonna be night? How am I gonna flower? That's where that kind of strains come from. It's actually from Russia, same situation, different area. You got sativa, great for daytime, gives you more of a buzz, like you feel up and lifted. And then you have your indica, which is heavier, good for pain, good for sedation, knocks you out. Usually high in mercy, which is the coyote of the blood-brain barrier, allows your cannabinoids to cross the blood-brain barrier, making it much, much more potent, which is why you get couch lock from indicas, like Kush and stuff like that. Uh, so there is a tremendous, tremendous amount of information to, sh to share. I have so much here, I can't get into all of it. Uh, I will speak a little bit about the new program, the ACMPR program. Um, a lot of people don't know this because they haven't really told anybody. I'm in a, I'm in a special position where I get to hear a lot of stuff. Uh, and uh, there is a limit, there's a threshold for when you're applying for your actual license for the ACMPR, you don't want to go above 15 grams a day. If you go above 15 grams a day, you're going to get put into a secondary pile where they do secondary oversight to make sure that you're actually legit. <clears throat> if you're under 15 grams a day, you go into the regular pile, which right now is sitting at about 1,200 Canadians waiting, 112 Canadians that actually have been licensed, and Health Canada is licensing roughly one Canadian every three days. So there's quite a wait coming for people who think they're just going to roll up and get their license and start growing plants. It's not the truth, it's not gonna happen, it's not gonna be fast, unfortunately. Uh, some people have ins, some people are able to get their licenses faster, apparently, but in my experience, that's not really the case. Um, if you're a part of the original MMAR program like I am, uh, you were there right from the beginning, uh, you're one of about 40,000 people that are licensed in Canada to, to grow their own product, to grow their own medicine. Um, and you're protected, by, you're protected by the injunction if you had your license before that magical date. Uh, John Conroy's in, injunction 
has protected all of us. Uh, but if you would like to move your license, if you've changed addresses, if you've been forced out because your house burnt down, if you really want to grow outdoors instead, if you want to up your prescription, it will be instantly void. You're only protected by the injunction if your license does not change at all. On the flip side, if you need a new copy of your license, you can contact Health Canada and they will mail you a reissue of your license, which is super handy. Even if you don't, even if you already still have one, it's a good thing to have backup because they're really big and they fall apart really easily. <clears throat> I myself, I, uh, I started a company consulting. It just kind of started. My dad got cancer and bloomed out from there. And I've been working with Lyme patients, cancer patients, lupus, Parkinson's, Alzheimer's, a lot of arthritis. Arthritis is the number one prescribed ailment in Canada. If you have PTSD, you can actually get your prescription subsidized. It's the only ailment for which the Canadian government will actually pay for your pop. <clears throat> um, and uh, let's see, last but not least. Um, yeah, we, we run a company called How to Use Cannabis. Uh, our website is just, it's almost finished today. It's howtousecannabis.com. And uh, we kind of help people navigate the big giant hole that sits in between getting prescribed cannabis and procuring cannabis because if you go to your doctor and say can I have some cannabis please after you've bent over backwards and told them every sad thing that you can possibly tell them and they say fine fine I'll give you some cannabis since you're so sick and you get it and then you go to your LP or you go to your dispensary and you say okay can I have some cannabis please the, the licensed producer will say, we can't tell you how to use it. We can't even tell you anything about it. All we can say is it's 12% THC, and we grew it. And that's it. A dispensary, you're going to get more information for sure. There's some dispensaries that I work with that are very knowledgeable and, uh, and definitely a far, far, far better experience than working with ELP or your doctor, who are both not allowed to tell you anything. So if you're ever interested in uh, seeking out our counsel or or a consultation for yourself or someone else who has cancer, Lyme, Parkinson's, lupus, the list is extremely long, arthritis, um, then uh, you can reach us at howtousecannabis at gmail.com and like I said, howtousecannabis.com will be up and running probably today, I think, as far as I know. And uh, if you have any other questions, we have a little booth back there. Uh, we're doing free consultations today, so if you want to know anything, you can just come up and sit down for 15 minutes and I will do my best to explain to you what's up and with what I know. So thank you very much for your time. This is a really fucking awesome thing to see. This is the first of many, many, many of these events that I think will be happening in this city in Vancouver. We're literally leading the country right now. Like there is no other cities where the municipal police have backed this movement like Victoria and Vancouver. So give it up for your cities and thank you very much. Keep it going from Kamal Evans, everybody, a pillar of cannabis health. Look at this guy. Handsome, smart, fit.